Well, on behalf of everybody here, Mr. Chan, thank you very much for that speech and laying out so, so many important concepts as to what is going on in Hong Kong at the moment. To introduce myself, I'm Jennifer Hughes. I'm the Asia Finance Editor for Reuters News. So those who've been following the news today will know we had some interesting developments with Blackstone, which means I've been paying a little less attention to reading up on accounting standards than perhaps I'd planned to today. So Hans, you might get away with some light questions from me. Maybe, we'll see. Um, while I'm introducing myself and a few thoughts, with the panelists, would you like to come up and make yourself comfortable? And I'll take the chair at the end. Um, I, my association with the IASB and IFRS goes back more than a decade now, when I used to be the Financial Times accounting correspondent, when they had the luxury of having someone who could just focus on the profession. I used to love telling people I was the accounting correspondent because it was the best conversation killer you have ever seen. <laughs> because you tell people you're a journalist and they get very excited. They kind of hope that you work for the Mirror or the Mail, the Daily Mail or the Sun, and they hope that you're going to tell them the inside story of Kim Kardashian's life. I said, no, I work for the Financial Times. Oh, okay, what do you cover? Accounting. Blank. <laughs> Every single time. But for me, it was one of my most fun jobs, which is why it's really great to be here to talk about the topic this evening. And if you just look at the headlines, you can see how important and how much a part of our life and our news it is. I mean, obviously, from the UK, my home country, we have the collapse of Carillion um, and questions about how they could pay out those dividends, how, they, how, how the management didn't see those write-downs coming when a bunch of short sellers clearly did from reading the accounts. Um, we also have an earnings season going on right now, so non-GAAP reporting, one of our perennial topics, is also front and centre. Um, from one study, and I'm actually lifting from Hans from one of your speeches here, almost 90% of the S&P 500 use non-GAAP measures, and companies that use core earnings or other such fun headings often have profits about 30% higher than those who stick with GAAP. Here in Hong Kong, we have our own fun and games, of course. Um, for those of you not familiar with the Hong Kong scene, uh, one of my, I confess, favorite stories the last year involved the so-called Enigma Network. Now, this wasn't an accounting issue per se, but what happened was we had the collapse of a bunch of penny stocks, small caps, um, all on the same day, at roughly the same time. Most of them lost about 90% of their value and wiped out six billion US dollars in market cap in under half an hour. Now, the only known connection between them was from an independent analyst in Hong Kong, David Webb, who'd gone through their disclosures and mapped the cross shareholdings between them. So without the accounts and without the disclosures, we wouldn't have even known about that connection between them. And the fact he called it enigma was just a gift to reporters like me, because that got the headlines. Um, obviously, in Hong Kong, we run the gamut from those small caps right through to well, you can't even call the giant state-owned enterprises large caps. They're, they're really mega caps. Um, and now most of them freely admit that their boards answer to party committees first. That's part of their bylaws. That's the sort of thing we're dealing with here. Um, and just to give you some scale of the numbers, and Melissa, I give you credit for pointing this one out to me, I looked through China Mobile's um, 2016 accounts. Now, China Mobile has more subscribers than most countries have population. Um, and in their expenses, their other expenses, apart from the list of about eight items, were worth, the other was worth $26.4 billion. Now of that, there's a bit of disclosure, 15.6 is maintenance, leases, etc. There's 50 million US dollars of corporate expenses in there, conferences, etc. That still left $10 billion with no explanation whatsoever. Now, these are some of the accounting issues that we get to face in Hong Kong, as well as, obviously, the independent audit regulator, which Ashley will address in a little bit. Now, while I take my seat, I'll start with the questions, because we're talking about Hong Kong IFRS past, present, and future. Um, and my panelists here pretty much claim no knowledge of Hong Kong IFRS past, apart from James. So I'm going to come to you first. I'm sorry, I should introduce the panelists first for those 
not familiar with all of them. Ashley Alder, um, Chief Executive of the SFC, as I'm sure familiar to pretty much all of you in the room. James Riley was running um, finance for the Jardine Matheson Group for a decade plus, was it? But now has escaped to be Chief Executive of Mandarin Oriental. I did want to ask you what your favorite Mandarin hotel is, but we'll do that later. Um, Hans, as you also all know, it uh, runs the ISB. And Melissa, Melissa Brown has a lot of experience as an analyst and is now with Dowbridge Capital. And for further description, I'll leave you guys to it. But James, do you want to talk about IFRS and the adoption of it within the Jardine Group? Because it went back a long way. Well, very happy to, Jennifer. Thank you. I mean, I wasn't involved in the sense it actually, we, we adopted international accounting standards within Jardine's in 1993, I think was the year, end of 92, 93, um, which made us, I think, the very first or one of the very first uh, major companies to adopt international accounting standards. The sort of um, chameleon-like nature of Jardines probably made that a, um, a, a sensible thing to do at the time. We had a, a, a um, registered, obviously, in Bermuda. We were listed in London and Singapore. We had our main operating offices here. And therefore, it was an opportunity to really make the statement that we were international, that the very different range of businesses we had in different countries um, made international accounting standards, in our opinion, the best means of having consistency across the globe in terms of the operations we had. But it did pose challenges so that in the early years, uh, for quite a long time, we were in fairly regular debate and correspondence um, on the subject, for instance, of investment property valuations, which uh, were not permitted to be included within the accounts in the early years. Um, and ultimately, I think it would have been in about 2005 that was brought in and permitted, um, which saved me. I became finance director of the group in 2005, saved me from having to carry on that lengthy uh, correspondence. But it, it was great to see um, adjustment and at, th at those time a lot of effort, as I think it still is, being put into <coughs> trying to consult and consider with, with parties in terms of what the right approach is. But actually also ongoing issues that still exist and are challenges, some of which we'll chat about today. But so 1993 was when we originally adopted international accounting standards. Okay, so that predates you technically. Yeah. It's the year I came to Hong Kong, so I was sort of aware of it. <laughs> I mean, but the investment property issue, from something I was going back and reading, um, an interview with your predecessor as CFO in Accountancy Age, of all places, and he said that Jardines pretty much helped the IASB with the standards that came out, that became IAS 40 as known, I think. I, I think that was the case. I wouldn't like to be too presumptuous on that, but we did engage very extensively and right at length as to the rationale and reason of why we felt it was important that investment property valuations did get included and, and fundamentally what it was we were advocating was put was into effect in 2005. Yes, so that value. market value could be reflected within the account. Well, since Hong Kong land has held some of its property since 1901, I guess we're done on the depreciation front there. So. That's a challenge. On the other hand, there's then the, ad, the opposite effect, and when we come to non-GAAP measures that we struggle with as Jardines and still have as a non-GAAP measure is the fact that therefore one puts uh, the revaluation surpluses or deficits through the P&L account, which if they aren't somehow separated out from the earnings, gives a very unrealistic and very difficult to understand number um, without that separation. So that's an ongoing point of debate in my mind that goes with that. All right, well look, moving on, because I think present and future are more interesting points of discussion. There's a lot more debate to be had there. Hans, for those of us who aren't trustees and maybe are not quite as up to speed with everything IFRS, can you just run through the big projects very briefly where you're at and what's next? Yeah, so uh, when I became uh, chair of uh, the ISB in 2011, uh, David Tweedy, Tweedy uh, told me that before I took office, uh, all the big four projects would be finished. Uh, lease accounting, financial instruments, uh, revenue recognition and insurance. Uh, and we are now uh, six and a half years later and we have finally finished the last one. <laughs> we have finished revenue recognition, which is a 
I think, a great standard, strong principles, fully converged with um, uh, US GAAP. So same top line all over the world. Lease accounting, very important progress. All leases on the balance sheet so that uh, investors can get a good view on the true uh, liabilities of a, uh, of a uh, company. Uh, financial instruments has been finished. Um, uh, it's going to be, is, uh, uh, effective date was uh, beginning of this year. Uh, and much more uh, will force banks to treat uh, bad loans more realistically and uh, accept uh, inevitable losses uh, much more quickly, which I think is uh, very important for uh, investors. And then we, um, we just finished uh, IFRS 17, the insurance standard, which I believe to be uh, the most important of them all because uh, insurance accounting is extremely diverse all over the world and often of very poor quality. So this is going to be extremely important for the transparency of the industry. A and let me just tell you why I love Hong Kong so much, except for being a great city. But, uh, Christina Ang, uh, the chair of the, the, the local standard setter, she, uh, she was uh, attending the trustees meeting this, this today and she sort of apologized that it took them all of six months to endorse IFRS 17. Usually they do it in four weeks. And I just thought, oh God, if the whole world could be so slow as uh, Hong Kong, that would be a great thing. <laughs> because in Europe, it's going to take a long, long time. But when I first started to cover accounting, um, the first standard I ever came in to discuss with IASB members was IFRS 4, which is insurance count contracts. Yes. So to see you've now moved on to 17, suggests progress to me. Absolutely. Um, how is... Am I right in thinking, and forgive me, I should know this, 15 is now already in effect and well underway. It just became effective yes. this year as well. Yes. Leasing and leasing becomes effective next year. So this year the big ones are IFRS 15 and IFRS 9. Uh, yes. And next year lease accounting. Yes. So we are keeping the audit firms uh, pretty busy, to much to their liking. <laughs> but after IFRS 17, it's over, uh, guys. Then you have to make your own money. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask what came... Look, let's start on IFRS 17. I don't want to go too much into insurance yeah. accounting because that will just kill the conversation, I'm afraid. Anyone want to disagree? <laughs> no, exactly. Um, well, look, what's... The, uh, okay. Just very quickly, the main thrust of IFRS 17. For example, there are now insurance companies, local gaps that tell insurance companies if you receive deposits to invest on behalf of your customers, you have to count that towards revenue. Yes? So deposits being counted as revenue. This is happening still. Uh, what is also happening is that um, insurance companies that use historical cost accounting, and that is also still rather prevalent, that they will discount a, an insurance contract from 15 years ago, a life insurance contract, at an interest rate of 15 years ago. Interest rates are a bit small, a lot lower these days, and the true extent of the liability is much higher than you get through historical cost accounting. These are just two examples of antiquated uh, accounting methods. Uh, all these insurance companies have to provide non-GAAP measures. Uh, to, uh, you know, to compensate for the poor uh, accounting. But of course, they do it all in different ways. Uh, so that's why I think this is also, in, uh, you know, with the perspective of financial stability, this is absolutely essential that this happens, and quickly. See. Well, Melissa, I know you've got some strong thoughts of this. And I should say, when I talked to all the panelists, I warned them that Hans would mention insurance accounting, and I promised we'd keep that bit as brief as possible. <laughs> and Melissa was like, it's really important. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is important, and I think in, in some ways, Hong Kong as a, as a market really makes the case. Um, you know, I think this is a marketplace that pays a great deal of attention of necessity to the largest mainland Chinese insurance companies. Um, not only do they have organic growth potential of a significant sort, but they are huge players in the economy. And the Hong Kong market from an investor perspective is not one that, to be very honest, is endowed with a lot of analytical strength on insurance companies. Um, in my last role as, a, as an Asian head of equity research, 
which was at Citigroup, usually what we would do when you had a, a big insurance company that someone needed to analyze was you went to the junior banking analyst. And that's not really a way to get great insightful research on a very significant, rapidly growing, multi-jurisdictional insurance company. Now, Hong Kong has progressed from that point, in no small part because this is an exceptionally productive IPO machine, in no small part thanks to IFRS. But the fact remains that it takes very considerable periods of time for the investment community to develop the kind of analytical strength necessary to look at the types of very significant insurance companies that are now listed here. And I thought perhaps I was being too cynical, so I took, the, I took this opportunity to call a few of my friends to say, who's really good on insurance companies? And you know, how, do you, how far do you go into the accounts? And the short answer was, I manage a lot of money. I don't actually go very far into the accounts, and there are about two analysts I might call. So that's a scenario in which, quite honestly, the value of standards matters a great deal. It is foundational to this marketplace and to the, to the capital markets of China. So this is an area where making progress, without any doubt, stands to benefit mm. this market. So some form of standardization would help as well, because many analysts in Asia don't, don't always have the luxury of focusing on one country and one system. Correct. Absolutely. It makes, it makes a big difference. And, and these more technical sectors, um, you know, especially in a period where certain types of investors are less focused on their willingness to, to pay for research, this makes a difference. We're going to begin inevitably with the growth of passive across a range of markets, have to pay much more attention once again to broader systemic trends and standards that can be used to essentially inoculate very significant numbers of investors against problems with financial reporting standards. Unless, Ashley, this one's for you, um, unless you want to have vastly more active and aggressive and proactive enforcement, which is a hard thing to ask for given the diversity of Asian markets. All right, Ashley, I'm not going to start quite there, <laughs> maybe. As the investor on the panel, I can do this. <laughs> you can, go for it. As a journalist, I can do it too, don't worry. Um, Ashley's been dodging my questions for six years now, I think. Mm, quite successfully. <laughs> well, we can debate that. Um, while we're talking about sort of present, and one of the things I know that you wanted to bring up because of your IOSCO work, et cetera, was around sort of the audit thing. So let's just go into that. And what's going on? What is IOSCO trying to do there? It's a slightly separate topic topic, I know, but it's part of everything we talk about here. Yeah. Well, I could come back, if we've got time, I can come back to the Hong Kong sort of setting uh, in a moment. But we will do, don't worry. <laughs> um, but look, the, I think actually it's, there's a degree of symmetry around this to an extent, because I think Michelle, I think, mentioned that uh, some years ago, it was 18 years ago, that you, it was basically the project was kicked off <coughs> when you were chair of IOSCO, and I think IOSCO's view around uh, accounting standards is that the project has been enormously successful, not least in Hong Kong, but obviously elsewhere. So there is a high level of convergence. Some of the standards that have been looked at most recently tackle some of the more difficult areas, particularly when it comes to financial instruments and such. But again, that is seen to be largely um, successful. So the, the focus of IOSCO and its members is now not so much around um, um, accounting standards, but audit quality. And there has been, without doubt, a very high measure of concern um, across the membership, and in particular within the board of IOSCO, around audit quality issues. Um, and they tend to um, hit the headlines, obviously, when there's a large corporate failure. And the latest very large corporate failure Jennifer referred to, which was in, in the UK, and I think this kind of comes down to um, what has, has frequently been termed the sort of expectation gap as between what users of accounts and the public expect of auditing and what auditing promises. I always reflect when actually when I sign off our um, uh, representation and engagement letters and such like, when auditors audit our own accounts in the SFC, I'm always struck by the fact that there are pages and pages of what auditors do not do. 
There's very little that actually says what they do do. In actually, these that was written by lawyers like Absolutely. you, Absolutely. Right? No, well, yes, yes. And very well done, actually. <laughs> um, so, but there is an expectation gap. And the one that, coming back to my role as a regulator here, always strikes me is the basically encapsulated in the phrase which often appears, which is, audit procedures are not designed to detect fraud. Now, one of our jobs, clearly, as a regulator, not the only one, is to detect fraud. Incidentally, coming back to Hong Kong, um, it's interesting how coverage of some corporate issues and really effectively misconduct issues um, focus on either uh, research written by short sellers or articles published by well-known commentators. Um, I would not assume... I'm guilty on both counts. I'm not, Great sources I, of information. But I would not assume that uh, the issues that are then publicised have not been looked at very hard, but along a different track, because, of course, the short sellers have uh, an end goal, which is around profiting from the decline in the share price after having uh, short sold. And secondly, the commentator's job usually is ended with the publication of the piece, the role of the regulator is not only to establish what the story is, what the case theory might be, but also to uh, obtain evidence and then work through whether or not there could be an enforcement or another outcome. That is the hard part. Putting the story together at the beginning, although it's entertaining and it can be quite illuminating, is not the hard part. Anyway, that's just... Yeah, I, would dis I would disagree. There's a hard part there at the beginning, too. <laughs> it's not but as hard. Apart. They're both hard and one's, not, one's harder. But when you come, sorry, coming back to IOSCO, this thing about audit quality, I think there are expectation gaps. The commentary I've been looking, I've just been reviewing the uh, commentary around Carillion. Now, obviously, without talking about particular audit firms and such like, there is still a degree of kind of astonishment that, and I think you mentioned earlier on, that maybe some people were looking at page 78 of the accounts and they were able to short sell, sell because they thought there was a, co a company that was far more stretched than it would appear. We saw analysts, and it's been, you know, making, uh, many of them making um, uh, buy recommendations or overweight recommendations until relatively close to the point of collapse. Um, and on top of that, we have this sort of incredulity that um, uh, current r recognition in profits of uh, under certain contracting arrangements, basically long-term contracts, and deferral of costs can be part of the story, which when it all comes to, to when it comes to the point of collapse, then ra questions are raised about how, that, how could that be the case. Mm. Sorry, it's a very inarticulate way of expressing it, but you know what I mean. So when it comes back to IOSCO, audit quality is, seems to be the issue, and that comes about uh, to down to auditing standards. So what is actually happening at the moment is that firstly, the IFRS world is basically in a three-tier system, which I think Michelle referred to. In the audit um, standards world, there's a three-tier system as well. And I won't go into that, but basically the question is, should it be reformed? And a consultation is now out to, with the object of reforming it. Now, it is relatively controversial because what it is doing, in essence, is to effectively remove um, much of the perceived influence of the profession on the setting of the standards. Um, some firms are in favor, some firms are, are not, and we're now at the beginning of the consultation on that. But the general sense around the IOSCO board is that that direction is the right one. And to, in, a, in a sense, it kind of mirrors what's been happening locally because the SFC, I think, has always been in favor of the FRC um, becoming the independent uh, regulator of auditors. Um, partly in order to be able to join the global club of independent regulators of auditors, which it will do. Um, so that's a kind of an analogy for that, but that's what's out there. Second point is there is a concern around the consistency of approach and the expectations of audit committees. And th th so there's a strand of work that's now been launched within IOSCO, which is basically around can we 
land on best practices for audit committees because there seems to be a lot of confusion about how they interact with their companies, the preparers of accounts, what oversight they have over preparation, and how that interacts with the audit itself because they're actually sitting in the middle. Um, and a, an angle to that is how they deal with integrated reporting, which is another challenge for auditors now because it's much more complex. We have most recently the whole question of climate change and financial disclosures, which is also a bit of a minefield, but ultimately the audit profession is expected to get their heads around it. Um, and also key audit matters, which is relatively new. It's in operation in, in the early days, but key audit matters is all about the difficult conversations that auditors have with audit committees yeah. and how you disclose against it. There's a concern that that could end up with a kind of boilerplate disclosure, or will it actually be taken up as um, uh, you know, disclosing real discussions around serious issues so that the, um, so the public and investors can be fully informed. So those are the strands, really, of the work that uh, we're doing. One audit committees, and they're interlinked, audit committees, and the other is audit standards. But to the credit of the people in this room around IFRS, we're not so much focused on IFRS because, as I say, that 18-year project, and though not quite completed, it seemed to be um, uh, very successful. I think it would be a relief to everyone to know that you're not focused on IFRS <laughs> at the moment, Ashley. But we um, still need your help a little bit on IFRS 17. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not a done deal yet. No. Uh, we need support from the regulatory community yeah. that this needs to be done because, you know, the present situation is just totally unacceptable. So it's, <clears throat> you're saying that with IFRS 17, it's stalled, stalling? No, 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 but it's no. still going through endorsement processes and some people still need a little bit of uh, prodding that, uh, you know, it's a good thing. Yeah. Okay, moving on slightly to, I say, IFRS future. Um, one of the points I picked up on from looking at some of your speeches was that, you know, this idea that the ISB is going to get more prescriptive on the income statement. Yes. Um, you know, accounts, accounting has long recognised the primacy of the income statement because it's what everybody looks at. Yes. Top line, bottom line, etc. Yeah. You're now talking about getting into the bit in the middle. Yes. And defining some of that. It's all about the middle. <laughs> How is that going? Are you getting pushback? Um, well, we don't know yet, uh, but this is something that um, investors have been uh, asking us for for a long time. Um, if you look at the income statement, which indeed is the basis for valuation of almost all companies, except for perhaps the financial industry where the balance sheet is much more important, uh, but the income statement is, is absolutely uh, essential. IFRS defines revenue, IFRS defines profit or loss, and that's about it. And uh, both preparers and uh, also investors are interested in subtotals. Things like operating income, EBIT, uh, adjusted EBIT, etc., etc., uh, drilling down the numbers. And there we just def don't define very much. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why non-GAAP has become so prevalent. Uh, by the way, we think non-GAAP is there to stay uh, because companies will always have, um, you know, specific situations that they want to explain to uh, investors and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but one of the reasons why non-GAAP has become perhaps a little bit too prevalent and always on the optimistic side or usually on the optimistic side is that we prescribe so little. And yes, uh, investors and companies are interested in showing or reading what is EBIT, what is operating income, uh, what is the main, the, what are the core earnings of a company. So what we are doing now is we are trying to find a principle-based definition of uh, EBIT, for example, and we are defining some other categories in the income statement. And that will, <clears throat> well, first of all, it will give more uh, rigor and discipline in the income statement. Uh, companies will have to explain better why they still need to make an adjustment when EBIT is already there. And it will also be much easier for uh, regulators to force companies to make reconciliations to, for example, EBIT instead of just to revenue or uh, profit or loss. 
so we will deliver a couple of more anchor points in the income statement, uh, and that should be beneficial to investors, should also be beneficial to regulators in, in, uh, uh, in their job of uh, investor protection. If I said I reckon this is going to get way more press coverage than IFRS 17, that's not to do down the importance of yeah. insurance accounting. Yeah. It's just this is critical to everything. I would say that I'm more cynical than you. You're giving companies the benefit of the doubt and saying it's because we left it up to you that you come out with these measures. Um, I don't see many companies that produce non-GAAP measures that have a worse result than GAAP would have done. About 20%. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Well, okay, 80% still on my side here. Yeah. Um, Melissa, I'm coming to you because I know you have some views on this. Should the ISB get more prescriptive, and how prescriptive should they get? Well, I'm not sure that I have a great answer on the, the how question, but um, I have to admit one of the things that, that I try to do at this point is, having spent most of my career um, working in the active, long-oriented part of the equity world, when I hear a proposal or discussion of something new, I try to run it against sensible assumptions that actually relate to the massive change we're seeing in the growth of passive. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, index-based investing is really just you know, kind of the, uh, you know, the, the beginning of what we're going to see. And I mean, I'm personally tremendously fascinated around a lot of the factor-based investing and a lot of the algorithmic strategies. And, uh, you know, as you roll some of the accounting trends forward with, you know, real-time access to general ledger and everything else, essentially what we're talking about are different strategies of how data is accumulated, combined, and communicated to investors. And so when I kind of put that all together in a big round ball, I cannot possibly see a scenario where it will be less important to have a good definition of EBIT with some more prescriptive items. I think it becomes massively more important. And make no mistake, active investors like me, I love non-GAAP items. They're fun. You, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a way of, of cross-checking how a company communicates. You use it to cross-check as the way their style of corporate reporting. You try to see if you can reconcile. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. You look and see who's obsessing about it in a way that you think might be extreme. That's fun. But that's not really where the investment world is going. And if you look at the trends that we're seeing broadly in passive, it means that something that's a bit more prescriptive, that deals with very fundamental issues, where there's far too often a lack of clarity, it simply means this has to be very, very important. And I'm I think really happy to hear this. There. Because th th there, there are a lot of people who say that, you know, with the advent of mass uh, well, big data, uh, and artificial intelligence, everybody's talking about these uh, things, that standards almost become in, uh, you know, uh, not so important anymore because let the computers do the work. <laughs> but I strongly believe that the more information becomes available electronically uh, and is being consumed electronically, the more important it is that we have more structure. Uh, otherwise, it becomes a chaos. And uh, so I'm, 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 that, that, that was an intuition uh, on my side, and I'm very happy to hear that well, confirmed. To give you an example to put that in context, at, at one time I worked with uh, what I thought was an extremely good quant team. And they had lovely computer you know, expert phrasing for what they did, which was every once in a while their model liked things that they thought were bad for performance the model would inherently like certain types of Japanese companies where they thought actually the accounting was horrible and they actually didn't regard the net income to be what they regarded as net income. And so they would essentially kind of push it out to the side. And that's exactly the scenario you've got here. When you've got a lot of money being run on passive and algorithmic strategies, it's going to be definitionally based. And that's just as true as you move into the sustainable investment world, where you have investors trying to define types of activities they like in companies. And they're going to be looking at ways of defining companies that can be included or not included based on revenue, based on operating income, based on net profit. That's where the value add is going to be. And that's where a lot of the most interesting people in the investment world are playing right now. So I personally think this is a piece of, of that really quite critical infrastructure. Mm. I think those two things are 
different in the sense that I agree what both of you have said in terms of the importance of having definitions down through the PL account. And it's always surprised me that it is so loose and that yeah. there's so much freedom. And you sit there and sort of say, well, what do I mean by operating profit and what am I meant to mean by it? Um, I think it's really key, however, that corporates are permitted to give non GAAP measures, um, not excessive pre preeminence, but enough visibility, because otherwise some real nonsenses can arise. But in a different area like sustainability, which is a subject I feel passionately about, I'm not convinced that accounting should come in and be telling companies what they have to do and don't have to do. I think it's up to companies to make the judgment if they wish to disclose it and bringing themselves within the parameters of the investment community to allow that investment community to make those judgments. And if investors are not going to invest in them because they don't give certain disclosure, then that's a judgment that they can make. But I do think for accounting to start really digging in into things other than the premier elements of financial disclosure would be unwise and bring it into quite uncertain ground. Well, and still we're going to do some work there. Yeah. Let, I, I, let me just pause uh, there because yeah, right, yeah, I should yeah. correct you on one oh. point actually. I was specifically referencing um, specialized sector funds, for example, water funds. Okay. And many of those funds will use a criteria where they say to be included in this fund, we'll look for those companies where X percentage of the revenues is derived from a water utility, for example. And some will then go a little bit further and they say, no, we don't want top line, we'd like operating income. So I'm really speaking more about, about, about those ones. I think it's, um, I, you're absolutely right. As we get into the much more interesting realm of thinking about really what sustainability means, it's going to take you straight to integrated reporting. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, a fun and Another. <laughs> less automated topic, I'm afraid. But I mean, somebody has to put parameters around how we look at sustainability reporting. I'm also not convinced it's the IASB's job, um, but we do need standards to be set somewhere. And well, can, can I tell you what we think we are going to, what we are try, trying to do? There are a lot of value drivers for companies that are, will never be adequately captured in the financial statements because they're so hard to recognize and hard to measure, like in the value of intangibles, increasingly yeah. important. Sustainability issues, what, what do they mean for the future profit of a company when you're in mining or in oil or uh, uh, the automobile uh, industry? Very important information for investors will never be adequately c captured in the financial statements. We rec recognize that. So we, are never, we will probably not make standards to try to capture that. Um, however, uh, it is important information uh, f for investors to know about. Um, we have already uh, in the past made an, um, a management commentary practice statement, non-mandatory, but as a sort of free guidance to, uh, uh, to, to companies. And we are uh, now in the process of starting to update that for new developments in integrated reporting, sustainability reporting, uh, better explaining what your business model as a company is. We will not make sustainability standards. We are not equipped to do so, but we can hopefully give guidance to companies as to how to put a, a, a good integrated report uh, together. Yeah. One thing I want to come back on is something that, Melissa, you were mentioning there um, about the way the fun stuff, about looking at accounts, looking for the non-GAAP measures, what does that tell you about a company, what it wants to present, how it communicates, etc. How is the investment world going to be divided? How much is going to be fun stuff and how much is going to be algos, artificial intelligence and number crunching? Now, I ask partly because I bring up James's um, record at CFO at Jardines here because Jardines always had that wonderful line in the accounts the complier explained bit with the independent non-exec directors, which Jardines doesn't have. <coughs> doesn't, doesn't disclose rather than doesn't have. All right, okay. But you have the complier explain line that says, we don't do this because we don't think it helps us. Full no. stop, move on. Which said a lot about what Jardines will communicate with people outside. And believe me, I've tried for years to get more information out of that company, <laughs> and it's almost impossible. Um, but Melissa, back to this point. Like how much of it's going to be the fun stuff, like saying, I don't like that, this tells me this company's going off in the wrong direction. How much is going to be computers? 
I think it really depends. It, you know, one of the, the greatest risks that, that afflicts the investment community, and I think that also is a real problem for um, whether it's regulators or certainly the accounting and the auditing and the standards world. One of the biggest problems is to figure out how to engage with the investment community because we're all absolute experts at puffing up and saying, investors think X. Uh, but it's an exceptionally diverse community. We are really typically defined by the part of the market that we've inhabited, the skills that we've accumulated, and we're really great at then projecting our self-image onto markets. So with that caveat, um, you know, I'm an equity person, and I worked in the active world, and I'm pretty accustomed to um, all of the traditional processes of, of equity investment. But here's what's fun and interesting. As we see active managers under tremendous pressure around performance and changing dramatically as that happens, and the immense growth of, growth of passive, I think two or three things will happen, and I'm not unique in, in, in thinking this. Those people who stay and hope to continue to you know, appropriately manage other people's money using active strategies, I'd like to hope we'll, we'll become better at it and become more discerning, and equally that they will become more expert at communicating about what they do. One byproduct of that, and we see it less in Hong Kong than we might in others, and that's because we don't have the leadership of significant asset owners in Hong Kong, um, is we don't see the same attention to stewardship and mm. system level thinking that we do see in other markets. <clears throat> but having said that, there is an immense zone of play for highly skilled investors to offer different views. And one of the things that I'm very conscious of is I think about you know, who in this community do I know and as I was kind of calling around, uh, you know, where do I find pockets of really serious accounting skills sitting in an active investment context? In Hong Kong in the last five years, they're doing special sits, distressed debt, and structured credit. They're looking at a lot of convertible bonds. They're playing around a lot in China. They're looking at anything with an asset. They hire forensic accountants. A lot of them have serious accounting skills. Well, in the meantime, some of the mainstream investors are pretty much following the flow. It's not to say they don't test the accounts, they do. But if they have hit a moment of mistrust, can't, can't reconcile something interesting but not that credible in a non-GAAP measure with what the company told them the last time they saw them, they're either out of the stock or they've applied a discount to their valuation model and they like to think that they're hedged a little bit relative to their exposure. But there are zones of this market where people play very, very actively. Um, but you don't see them in the traditional way. And I think it's important to stress that the diversity of the investment community now means that at times some of the players who have the most at risk, who have invested the most and have sometimes extremely strong opinions, are not dressed up as equity investors. James, you're nodding. There. Well, I think that's right. I mean, I think increasingly there's a big portion of the most active investors who are not seen as equity investors. And indeed, the relevance, one of the concerns I have from a public markets point of view is, is if the public markets become ever increasingly regulated, the degree to which they're becoming increasingly irrelevant. So that most people um, looking for investment opportunities won't go to the public markets. And the, and the best opportunities actually never come to the public markets increasingly yeah. as the private equity segments increasingly grow. Mm. I mean, in your time as CFO in the Jardine Group, did your interaction with investors change over that time? Assuming you talk more to investors than journalists. Yes, I mean, we did, absolutely we did. <laughs> and uh, yes, I mean, we, we always took the view that um, all investors we would engage with and talk with. Um, to provide transparency. I mean, we probably provide more information than anyone else, because I don't think many people have 20 listed companies, 20 sets of annual reports, etc. Actually, I don't think I ever met anyone who had ever bothered to read them. So the problem was, actually to Melissa's point, the depth of analysis and the trouble people took to go through the information, because there's an incredible amount out there. But I always took the view from dealing uh, with the markets that we would talk to investors, all investors, to provide transparency in terms of the information that was available. But we were never trying to sell them a story. And that's probably the big difference with a lot of companies in terms of the approach. Neutral. 
It was one of the things that made the group very hard to write about because obviously in my journalist world, what we are looking for is stories. And you made it very difficult for me to find them. No news is good news. <laughs> <laughs> it really was most of the time, but not for me. Um, <laughs> this is not fake news. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, look, moving on slightly, and I'm sorry, I should have said before, I, I did say to the panel, we are happy to take questions from the floor. So do raise your hand and wave it around if I don't notice, and if any panelists notice anyone with a hand up, let me know. Um, corporate reporting standards in Hong Kong. This is one of the things I wanted to address because it's an issue we live with every day. There's, there's a general perception out there, if not always in Hong Kong, then elsewhere in the world, that the standards, the standards of Chinese companies are not always what we'd like them to be. Hong Kong is a target for short sellers. Um, we often, I often get questions from colleagues and editors elsewhere in the world, both in my time at Financial Times and now at Reuters. When I was at the FT, we were very involved in the Hanergy saga, which was a solar cell equipment mm. manufacturer that rocketed uh, thousands of percent in the share price, then managed to fall 50% in about 24 minutes, wiping out 19 billion in market cap, at which point it suspended itself. This was May 2015, it still hasn't listed. And I know, actually, there's probably not much you can say about this one. But what I'm trying to say is there's lots of issues around corporate reporting in Hong Kong. One thing I did want to ask you, do you want to lay out just how the SFC looks at market misconduct and looks at reporting and where <coughs> your role sits within that? Yeah, I mean, look, in relation to corporate, report, corporate reporting as distinct from auditing, which I think is what you mean. Yes. Um, we, because we do not regulate auditors uh, directly, that's for the HKICPA and the FRC, we focus on corporates, directors, and their advisors, basically. And their advisors, including in the context of IPOs, sponsors. So that's where the focus is quite rightly. So actually, in, in, in the accounting world, I suppose that's focusing on the preparers and those who advise them, uh, or an accounting jargon, sort of. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, uh, what we see at the moment is um, a market of mainland businesses listed in Hong Kong who ha actually have grown up enormously over the last you know, 20, 30 years, certainly since well, early 90s, since the H, H shares were first introduced in Hong Kong. Um, I think it is a process of, of adaptation. I think that auditors, and it comes back to, to, audit, to auditing standards, actually, from the auditor's perspective, and this disparity between the preparers and the auditors, and again, the expectation gap of what each is meant to be doing. Um, I think, undoubtedly, there are still issues. There are, it's a minority issue. If it was a majority issue, I'd be really, really concerned, but I don't think it is. But there are issues around the ability of um, uh, advisors, whether they're IPO sponsors or continuing advisors or auditors, to uh, kick the tires in uh, companies which are essentially cross-border. You know, because if you remember, you know, Hong Kong's great strength is acting as a hub and a gateway. Uh, but that also means that uh, we uh, are dealing with almost, in all cases, cross-border issues. So when it comes to you know, your question about how we operate as a, um, uh, effectively as an enforcement agency around these issues, um, a lot inevitably depends on our relationship with our counterparts in the mainland, regulatory counterparts in the mainland. And all I'd say in relation to that, and I've said this publicly in the, in the past, but I'm not sure it's really resonated because it's not a, it's not a story as such, you know? You blame it doesn't, me, it doesn't yeah. have a corporate name attached to it, but basically the big change in, or sort of step change in our relationship or an ability to cooperate cross-border around these sort of issues was actually Stock Connect. Not because Stock Connect was, um, uh, not because of the characteristics of Stock Connect itself in detail, but more to do with the fact it was the first time uh, that the mainland uh, had connected with an overseas market, enabling overseas investors to invest in the A share market and vice versa, absent an individual quota, yeah. basically. 
individual quotas meant that, uh, say, uh, institutional investors looking to invest in the mainland were uh, identified, and there was a large measure of control about repatriation of, of earnings, et cetera, et cetera. So Stock Connect changed all that. And then the short point is that um, it became rapidly apparent to the mainland authorities through that system that there was a greater need for co-dependent um, uh, enforcement and supervision cooperation, uh, just as we do with other overseas regulators, the SEC or the, you know, the FCA or the European regulators and such like. There's nothing particularly unusual about this. And that's because there was, a, there, was an, uh, there was an alignment of interests. So, for example, the CSRC would become much more concerned around the exposure of mainland investors to mainland businesses listed in Hong Kong that may or may not have problems. Um, and by the same token, they would be concerned around overseas investors coming through Hong Kong, investing in the A-share market that may be intent on market misconduct and manipulation. So for that reason, our, our, um, our, our, the incentives to cooperate did align. And that that's has led to something which is actually incredibly healthy from my perspective as a regulator, which has led to a completely different dimension of cooperation. Now, the reason that is important is as much, isn't much to do with um, the question of IFRS, et cetera, but the reason that's important is that, is that then we can start um, uh, operating together to detect problems and deal with them uh, collaboratively. And this is what we're now doing. Um, and that in itself is noticed by the minority of corporates and corporate actors and leadership of uh, leaders of corporates who are intent on misconduct. That is noticed. And it has a major effect, actually, because you can see it's basically a deterrent effect mm -hmm. uh, around that. So that's really where we are now. And I, I expect that will develop. And it's important because, um, for Hong Kong, because my view is that because we're in this unique position of one country, two systems, it's only the Hong Kong uh, regulators, not just ourselves, but the Monetary Authority and others, who are in a position at the moment to establish these relationships with the Chinese authorities uh, uh, on the other side of the boundary. But it does mean that as we establish these, it's the basis on which um, the uh, connects and similar, um, the sort of hub status of Hong Kong can increase over time. So that's really where we're at. No, but thank you for going through that because in Hong Kong, for Hong Kong listed companies, for a lot of the stuff that investors are looking at, the presentation of the accounts, how things are reported and what isn't, isn't covered is almost as, well, as important as the accounting standards. Yeah. But Hans, I'm going to bring this back to you. But sorry, sorry, just just to just to. On the, okay. It's one thing I actually haven't sort of this on my, out of my own mind because we look at these from a very different angle. The accounts are simply one aspect of what we look at. But I and again, it comes to this question of auditing standards, the expectation gap, which is when we look at a situation where there's a high degree of artificiality. And you may well go back to the Carillion story as well, or apparent artificiality as to how a business is conducted. And when you deconstruct it, you can, uh, you can work out how artificial it actually is. How that correlates with an audit around going concern and a true and fair view, when it boils down to it, is often quite concerning. I'll just leave it at that. This no, no, you could go on on that. No, Those... no you were going to ask somebody else a question. <laughs> <laughs> After disrupting my train of thought, you don't go and do that. Thank you. That was a good point. I mean, we come back to the issue of sometimes in accounting, it must feel that there is nothing, I want to say nothing new under the sun. Of course, we're changing the standards, but just a lot of the problems, a lot of the problems at Carillion and the ones we've seen elsewhere. You said this to me in conversations we had before the panel, that some, a lot of the problems we see are just the same problems in different the same accounting issues come up every time. But anyway, I'll come on from that one and move on to Hans, because we have moved on to corporate reporting and away from accounting standards slightly. Now, when I went back over my notes and thoughts of what we talked about on this panel three years ago, um, the idea of convergence with the US was mm. not entirely dead then. <laughs> Would it be, f maybe, am I being too cynical in thinking, it's, that's not gonna happen, it's never going to happen. Never, I would not say. 
uh, I will, it will not happen during my chairmanship and probably not a couple of chairs later. Um, but um, I think you're optimistic. If we, uh, uh, yeah, so the United States have decided to make US gap great again before uh, Trump even uh, became president. <laughs> but, but, but what, um, what uh, it is all dependent on our own success. If we succeed in consolidating Europe and uh, Canada, Latin America, and this big continent here, and we are well on our way. But, you know, success is never guaranteed. The success we've had this far, you never know where it ends. Uh, India uh, has to, you know, still come fully on board. Uh, China is getting closer and closer, but also still has to make the final step. If that would happen, and then we consolidate, um, and the whole global investor community is used to that, then there will come a time also when the United, the United States will always remain a huge, in, hugely important capital market, of course, but it will proportionally become a bit smaller. There will be a time that the United States will say, isn't this a bit silly, this situation? Uh, and they will come on board. So long term, always have to think long term. Long term, it's going to happen. <laughs> um Melissa, does it matter to you as a user of accounts that there are still these divergences? I mean, the difference between US GAAP and IFRS sometimes looks more like a dialect than you know, a different language. So that is, you go through all the extra disclosure and extra pages of rules, they, you could actually build a wall out of, well, let's not suggest that to Trump, or out of FASB and all yeah. the rules that go with it. I, uh, there's a, there's a, a game that, that uh, I'll generalize now, I'm going to break my rule. There's a game that investors are really, really fond of when they find themselves across the table from anyone having a policy discussion. And it's the comparability game, where we, we, we sit up straight and we say, well, yeah, that's great, but, but actually, we need comparability. Um, I'd like to ride that back to my comment about passive. Um, when you have very, very large index-based products um, listed and trading in multiple markets, if you then overlay um, additional um, selection criteria, then comparability is going to be an issue. But that's in the context of a, of a low-cost, broad-access product. So yes, there, there, there are and will be issues. Most active investors, theoretically, this is one of the things they get paid to deal with. Um, and you know, w there is no question when you're trying to look at a particular equity in the, in the context of global peers, um, there are instances where you're going to have to make adjustments or be aware of those differences, whether that works in the favor of gap-based US equities or works against it at this stage of the game. Um, you know, I'm tempted to say it's something that people have become fairly adept at dealing with. The other thing that I would stress is as Asia grows and the, the, the global weight of very large Asian equities also grows, the, the normalized um, definition for certain sectors changes. So how we talk about comps also changes. And I don't think that's a bad thing. What it does mean is that you don't do sloppy comparatives and you don't toss together you know sloppy tables where you say here are the five best global property companies because in most instances those companies structurally aren't comparable in the slightest um, you know it's a fun game to play but it's not really all that enlightening when I used to uh, write the Lex column for the FT from Asia we had to I had to write a, a note on a company or a sector every single day. And the thing that had me tearing my hair out more than anything was trying to compare companies across countries, jurisdictions, the rest of it. So for me, the idea that IFRS will become the global standard would be phenomenal. It already is. <laughs> <laughs> you just haven't told the guys in Norwalk, the well, FASB guys, that yet. It already is, because we can even use it there. I mean. All companies in the IFRS world can use IFRS all over the world. Yeah. So it is already there, except for when you're American and you cannot do it. Look, turning to a very general point, um, 
you know, I, I joked at the beginning about saying I was the accounting correspondent and stopping all conversations stone dead. Um, That's what st it's stopping people from eating tonight, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm getting a little bit worried. But, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll wrap up in a minute. Okay. Um, there's, always a, there's always a lot of talk. Okay. <laughs> Fine, we'll make this the last question. <laughs> Have you missed your dinner time, Hans? Stopping yeah. me from eating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we've got to the nub of the entire panel, okay. uh, dinner time. Um, one very general question that's always leveled at accounting is that it's just too complex. It's not possible that people, as James said, don't bother reading it. Even the experts don't bother reading it. Um, I'm pretty certain all of us have got a sort of defense against this. A sort of a thought, so I'm going to ask all of you to just talk about that for a minute. Is accounting too complex? And if so, what should be done about it? And Melissa, you're looking thoughtful, so I'll start with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to retreat into my great theme of this panel, which is to say, in some senses, markets are, uh, are reacting to a degree of that complexity, yeah. uh, which is one of the characteristics of passive is another way, if you want to be an economic rationalist, which is not typically my favorite posture, but I'd rather think about it in the context of incentives. You know, the, the message that we're getting is that the payoff from looking in a very detailed way at the current moment, given the pricing structure and the fees associated with active investment product, hasn't yielded a sufficient payoff. So I'm, I'm reluctant to say that all of that complexity rests on the shoulders of accounting, you know, accountants and accounting standards, but I think the message here is that for investors, and when I think about the context of capital markets, um, I think about companies that want to raise money and investors that want to invest predominantly long-term, um, that, that the, the value proposition has shifted, and it is a move away from complexity. James, thoughts? Well, the world is complex, and it, it struck me particularly um, on a body that um, Hans put together on revenue recognition of putting together various people looking and reviewing at what was intended in the standard that I sat on sort of um, three and four years ago, and I'm not sure I made a very useful contribution. And one of the reasons for that was that as one went through all of the issues involved in something like revenue recognition against the extraordinary diversity of businesses that are out there and range of activities, it was unbelievably complicated. And every time you thought you'd got a simple point that was clear, there were 15 businesses with a rationale as to why that didn't make sense. And that simply comes back to the fact that accounting has to be complicated, but also why it has to be so clearly regulated and defined in standards. So there is a standard definition of how you get there that applies to everyone across the board but it's also why then non-GAAP is important to allow, because there'll always be a reason why someone wants to explain something against that and should be permitted to do so. But the simple fact is the world is complicated and accounts, accounting is inevitably going to be so um, as well. And anyone who goes back to the idea of once upon a time, you know, depreciation was very simple or revenue was very simple, the fact is that the world's not the same as it was 80 or 100 years ago when revenue was simply sales. You've probably got the Jardines accounts going back that far, right? <laughs> Ashley, thoughts? Uh, well, not to keep people from dinner, I agree with James. It's inevitably complicated. That's the first time you've ever agreed with me. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> Hans, that means that you get the last word. I think it's very simple. I mean, when an untrained accountant can lead the ISB, it must be simple. <laughs> <laughs> I think at that point, that's absolutely the right point to leave it. It just remains for me to say thank you very much for the panel. I hope you guys have enjoyed it in the audience, and thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.